Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Rivlin. I'm the interim director of the Hugh L. Carey Institute for Government Reform at Wagner College. Welcome to the Carey Institute's uh, fall lecture, the Alan Francis Hockman Memorial Lecture, where we'll be talking about the election. It's an election post-mortem, who won, who lost, and what it means. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Lily McNair, uh, Wagner College's Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. Thank you, Mark. I bring you a welcome greeting on behalf of President Garassi, who sends his regrets due to an emergency, family emergency, he can't be with us tonight. But he had been so looking forward to this event. You know Dr. Garassi was a, got his degree in political science, so he would have been right up here in the mix with all of you. He would be sitting down. Oh, there. that's right. We'd have to. <laughs> It's great to see all of you here, all of the students who are here, all of you who are keeping up with what's happening in our state, in our city, in our region. I'd like to also welcome our trustee, Ms. Aletta Diamond, and her spouse, Mr. Robert. I said to Mark earlier, as a psychologist, when we had postmortems, they went like this. A therapist would see a client behind a one-way mirror, and the group would watch, observe on the other side of the mirror. And after the session was over, the group who was observing would sit with the therapist, and we do a post-mortem. We dissect everything that happened in the session, the whys, the wherefores, what if, we could, could have, should have. We're doing a different post-mortem today. And I welcome all of our guest panelists here, and we look forward to a lively discussion as we, dis as we examine the implications of the election yesterday. Thank you all for being here, and, and a special welcome to our guest panelists. Thank you, Dr. Mayor. I'd like to uh, give some thanks for all of you who've come. Uh, for my students, for uh, Professors uh, Ghosh, Esser, Unger, and Weinrob, and their students. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Cary Institute staff, Suzanne D'Amato and Morgan Roach, for all of their hard work on this event. And I want to thank uh, Robert Polner, Senior Research Associate at the Cary Institute, and Dan Janison of Newsday for helping us put together this uh, program and uh, helping us invite our guests. Let me introduce our guests for uh, this evening. Um, Ross Barkin is the senior political reporter for the New York Observer. Uh, John Lentz is the Albany bureau chief of city and state. Ozzie Pevara is uh, a report, city hall reporter for Capitol. And Richard Steyer is the editor of um, and columnist for the Chief Leader, a labor newspaper here in New York City. Thank you. And our moderator this, this afternoon is uh, Dean Seymour Lackman, former state senator, uh, dean of, and founder of the Cary Institute for Government Reform, and university, uh, pro, uh, distinguished university professor emeritus here at Wagner College. Uh, uh, Mark, thank you very much for giving me a seat and not having to stand at the podium. I have because I really haven't done this for a while, especially with people who are involved, not only in journalism, but the political aspects of journalism. Now, uh, Mark Rivlin has introduced all of you. I just want to mention to everyone here not to forget, as they're called upon to speak, regarding the national picture and the state picture. And I believe all of you have been informed that you will deal primarily with the state issues. Right, and I'll deal with the national issues after they're through because they're the important ones here. I just want to bring some information to your attention and which is really, really upsetting to me and should be upsetting to everyone in this room. Um, when you compare the voting percentages 
of presidential elections to midterm elections, uh, there's a vast difference, tremendous difference. And when you compare midterm elections to special elections, and there are some people who predict uh, there'll be a vast difference in the number of turnouts if someone who was recently reelected is found to be guilty on the 20 charges uh, he was said to, uh, to uh, be guilty of. There'll be a trial in February and a special election a month later. Now, these figures are <coughs> quite different than figures around the world, especially the West European industrial nations. For example, who has any idea of how many people vote in a presidential election in the USA? Uh, 59%. Very good, you're close, around 55%. Very close. Uh, unlike the European nations who have from 60 to 98 percent, except Belgium, which has 98 percent, has a law that we would not like. And that law says if you don't vote, you're taxed. It's a penalty. Uh, how many of you know how many people vote in midterm or state gubernatorial elections when there isn't a president running? All right, we drop from 55% to 35% maximum. And that 20% can make a difference. Because usually the president brings people in on his coattails for other offices, statewide and congressional. This was an election where nationwide, I would say, between 30 and 35% of the people turned out. Now, we in the borough of Staten Island and parts of Brooklyn that recently re-elected a congressman have a 50-50 chance of having a new special election in the spring after the trial is completed. And I hope he's innocent of the charges against him. But if he's not, there will be a special election. How many people turn out to vote in a special election? Anyone have any idea? Yes, sir? Are we just touching your huh? jaw? All right. <laughs> Anyone? 5% of the people in New York turn out to vote in the special election. So you go from 5% to 30, 35% to 55% and you realize the need for more voters to turn out. And this is with all the PAC monies that are spent, billions of dollars by the major parties. We'll come back to this at the very end uh, when I will give a national picture after our uh, guest speakers discuss the state government and what happened in the state elections and in their discussion, not only who won and who lost, but what it means for everyone's future in the Manzuli boardroom we're sitting now. Okay, anyone want to go first? Yes, Let's, I'll, we'll, I'll, go ahead. I'll go. This, I speak into the mic. Now that uh, this work or no? Yes, yes it does. Okay, go good. Um, in terms Let's of give them your name so they sure. Can. My name is Ross Barkin. I'm a political reporter with the New York Observer. I cover city hall, state politics. Uh, so your question was who won and who lost in the state state cycle. I mean, I think, I think that the biggest winner, biggest winner of the night immediately was, uh, like nationally, the Republican Party. Um, just for, just the, in brief, right now in the, the state Senate, the upper house of the state legislature, which has an immense amount of power, 
Um, the, the Republican Party, uh, for a variety of reasons, was able to win an outright majority, which they sort of had before this, where they were kind of in a coalition with a breakaway group of Democrats. I won't get too into that. But the Republican Party had a very strong night. Um, and so what you're going to have now for the next two years until the 2016 cycle is a Republican majority. And that means certain priorities, particularly in New York City, um, things people in New York City want, things the mayor of New York City wants, Bill de Blasio, may have a harder time passing in. And what are some of those things? I mean, the big thing is the minimum wage and that you know, definitely affects a lot of people, I'm sure, here. Minimum wage in New York City, in New York State, statewide minimum wage, that $8, $8 an hour. It's gonna, it's gonna rise through a previous deal up to eventually nine. Bill de Blasio, the mayor, wants to eventually have the power um, for New York City to be able to boost its wage up to really as high as th about $13 an hour. And so what you had now after last night with the Republican majority coming into power, um, they're very hostile to a minimum wage. So what you're going to see come next year is some of the things that more liberal Democrats in the city want may have a tougher time getting through the state Senate because of the Republican majority. So that, that's in the most immediate sense, I would say the Republican Party, just like nationally, was a winner in the state. And that's only in the state Senate. Otherwise, we're, we're base, basically a very democratic state. The Democratic governor won re-election. The attorney general won re-election. The state controller, they all won. But the state Senate, for a variety of reasons, and we, we can certainly dive into those as well, is uh, controlled by Republicans. And I'll let other people hop in okay, if they want. Okay, thank you, Ross. Uh, we'll get back to you later, probably. John Lentz. I'm John Lentz. I'm the Albany Bureau Chief at City and State Magazine. Um, I'd kind of add on to what Ross was saying. I would say uh, a winner and a loser would be Governor Andrew Cuomo. He, he won re-election. Um, it, was, it was expected. No one really thought uh, Rob Astorino, the Republican challenger, would, would have a chance to beat him. But he also lost in certain ways. Uh, he, he only got 54% of the vote. Uh, it's a common belief among the press corps that Cuomo one day wants to run for president. Uh, if you don't have these sizable landslide victories, maybe it can be harder to uh, go on and win the presidency. Um, on the plus side again for Cuomo though, I think he did profess that he wanted to have a Democratic majority in the Senate, in the state Senate. However, it's also kind of commonly understood among the press corps that Cuomo was quite happy to have a Republican Senate. And um, it, it gave him something to play two sides off each other. The Assembly, the lower house in Albany, it's heavily Democratic. The Senate for years and years, uh, with one or two exceptions, has been Republican. And, and that allows him to kind of balance things. He can, he can be a fiscal conservative. He had his property tax cap that was really popular in upstate at the same time. He was able to do more socially liberal things. He had a landmark uh, same-sex marriage law pass in his first term, um, other things like that. And so I won't babble on too much longer. I just basically, I think Cuomo is a, a winner and a loser. OK. We have all winners uh, speaking tonight. And uh, we'll go in alphabetical order now to Ozzy Tabaroff. I'll borrow yours. Sure, it's yours. Seems to work well. Um, I'm Ozzy Pabra. I'm a reporter with Capital New York. I worked at the Observer in a few other places in a former life. Um, just to pick up on, on what John Lentz had said, with Cuomo sort of being in the winner's column, but also being in the loser's column, if you heard his speech last night, it was 100% victorious. All the things he's going to do next year. And what was unstated was the part that Ross had pointed out, was that Republicans control outright the upper house of the state Senate, which means almost every single thing he said he wanted to do probably will not happen. Will not happen in the way that he had let his supporters at that victory party believe. Usually when somebody 
gives a concession speech, they say, we tried really hard, we failed, and there's an acknowledgement of failure. If somebody wins, they thank a lot of their supporters, they say, we worked really hard, we got something, and we're going to Washington, and we're going back to the Capitol, I'm going to try to get something done. Cuomo gave a victory speech, but governors can only, can only do so much. And if there was any lesson from Elliot Spitzer, from David Patterson, even from the three terms of George Pataki, was that you cannot govern without the state legislature. You can go to war with them and have a stalemate. You can cozy up with them and try to get them to be more efficient, but you can't ignore them and you can't get around them to, to a great degree. There's a little bit about budgeting that you can get through, but for the most part, you need their acquiescence to get certain things done. And one of the things that, that I remember Cuomo said uh, that he wanted to get done was campaign finance reform. Well, he had a state Senate, well, he had a democratically controlled assembly that supports it. He had a uh, bipartisan controlled state Senate, couldn't get it done. Now he has a Republican controlled state Senate and he thinks he can get it done. So it, that's one of the things that'll be interesting to watch. So in terms of Cuomo personally, he clearly won. There was really no opposition that he had. The, opposition, the, the, the real opposition he had was in the Democratic primary and he dispensed with that pretty handily. Um, and there's questions about Cuomo's relationship with his own party that are kind of fascinating. But where a Democratic executive goes after Republicans retain control of a key part of Albany is, is going to be a fascinating question. What does Bill de Blasio get now that he supported Democrats who failed to take over the state Senate? And what does Andrew Cuomo get now that he has Republicans to contend with is, is sort of the question going forward from here. Very good. Richard Steyer. Uh, let me talk first about uh, two entities that I think were losers. Uh, one was the unions, and in particular the public employee unions. Uh, basically, Cuomo got the Working Families Party endorsement in return for a bunch of promises that he made back in May and almost immediately renounced them to a large degree. And by the end of the campaign, he was taking shots at both the unions and at the Working Families Party. Last week, he told the Daily News editorial board that uh, the public schools were one of the last of the public monopolies, which was seen as a hard shot at the teachers' unions. Uh, he also was making fun of the Working Families Party, saying we've got a Working Families Party for tall people, Working Families Party for small people. I mean, basically he was mocking them because he was angry that they had forced him to make commitments in return for uh, giving him their endorsement. Uh, they also lost because of the fact that the uh, state Senate is now Republican controlled, which is going to make it much more difficult to get legislation that labor favors. And beyond that, they simply embarrassed themselves, partly by being hornswoggled by Cuomo, and partly because at one point uh, they engaged in something that was, uh, you could call it Cuomovellian in terms of the machinations in an attempt to gain a Democratic Senate. You had the state teachers union, New York State United Teachers, uh, which uh, ran campaign ads and spent an awful lot of money trying to defeat Mark Grisanti in the Republican primary. Grisanti was one of four Republican state senators who voted for the uh, Marriage Equality Act uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, they've all paid a certain price in their districts, and he was in for a tough fight. He was going against somebody who was more to the right of the spectrum than he was. And it's not that NYSA likes to back right-wing candidates. It was figuring that if it could uh, get Grisanti knocked out in the primary, that uh, the Democrat would wind up winning in the general election. Well, they turned out to be right that he did lose the Republican nomination, ran on uh, I believe it was the independence line in the general election, and uh, took enough votes away from the Republican nominee that the Democrat was elected. But basically, you still wound up with Republicans controlling the Senate, and you sent a message to anyone who was thinking about going against their party based on principle in the future that 
beyond the people who are going to be angry for that vote, there are going to be people who would have been pleased by the vote, but if they think there's a political advantage to it, they'll look to hurt you later on. So it makes it that much harder to get people to uh, show political courage in terms of going out and doing something that they believe in. Another person who was hurt, I guess Ozzie alluded to it a little bit, was Mayor de Blasio for the simple reason that uh, there being a Republican-controlled Senate is going to make it harder for him to get his initiatives done and because he had this big wave of momentum that he rode to victory last year, the fact that his message didn't play upstate and not only didn't it resonate with voters there, but uh, he himself was the target of a number of commercials that helped Republican candidates to win, tells you that for the moment anyway, his appeal is somewhat limited, that he may play well with uh, progressives around the country, but in terms of the larger New York State electorate, which is different from the New York City electorate, he's not quite as popular. Okay, I uh, just would like to add a few words. Uh, when Andrew Cuomo announced for re-election, you know, uh, there is an idea that in some states, and even the national government, uh, there is a family orientation, like sons or grandsons succeed, fathers or grandfathers. In New York State, Andrew Cuomo's father was governor in the 1980s, which is still in the 20th and not the 19th century. So some of the people in the room might remember it. And uh, he got 62% of the vote in running for his second term. He then lost to George Pataki uh, when he ran uh, again for a third term. Fourth, fourth term. Fourth term. And, the, and Andrew and his friends were saying that I'm going to get more votes than my father got when he ran for re-election. And his father was alongside of him during his, quote, victory speech when he had to admit, and everyone knew, he only got 54% of the vote. Now, for many people in the room, there are only Democrats and Republicans. But in New York State, there are other political parties. You have the Conservative Party, you have the Working Families Party, the Libertarian Party, the Green Party, and we're not sure that a fifth one will now emerge also. Depends on whether they get 50,000 votes or not. What impact or influence do these third, fourth, fifth, sixth parties have on the two major parties in New York? Anyone? Uh, sure, I'll go. They, they actually, they have a, an outsized impact. Um, you know, a lot of other states aren't this way, but in New, in New York State, you can run on multiple party lines. You can run as a Democrat, you can run on the Working Families Party, you can run as a Democrat and a Republican at the same time. And it sounds insane, but it's been done before and, and it will be done again. So in essence, what these third, fourth, fifth parties have at the minimum is a ballot line to offer. And what that gives voters is if you don't want to vote for someone on the Democratic line or the Republican line, maybe because you don't feel comfortable doing that, you know, you can cast your vote in the Working Families Party line, which is a sort of a more liberal party that's made up of labor unions as well as party activists. And if you're very conservative, there's the Conservative Party, um, which has been in power for some time. And what some of these third parties do, they have their own infrastructure, they have their own ground operation, their own um, you know, people doing things to help candidates get elected. And the, the biggest example of this is the Working Families Party, and they've been in, they've been in existence now um, since 1998, about. And what they do is that they've a coalition of labor unions and activists, and they have sort of they endorse Democrats, they rarely if ever run their own candidates, and they have an agenda, a more liberal agenda, and their goal is to kind of push the Democratic Party leftward, to, to have not so much the Cuomo centrism, which we've seen, but more so the Bill de Blasio brand of politics, or even something further left. The Conservative Party, which has existed for some time, kind of does the opposite, 
used to have the old Liberal Party, which was killed off because it didn't get 50,000 votes in a statewide election. And that's what I'll add to that as well. For these third parties to stay in existence, they have to get 50,000 votes in a statewide election, which the Working Families Party did, which the Green Party did. And the Green Party was in a very interesting place last night because their candidate, Howie Hawkins, got a pretty high number of votes for a Green Party candidate. He got about 5% of the vote. And what that meant was the Green candidate, Howie Hawkins, got more votes, raw number of votes, than Andrew Cuomo did running on the Working Families Party line. So now for the next four years, when you go into the go into the uh, ballot, you know, the ballot box and you have your piece of paper and you're coloring in your little ovals. You have row A, which is Democrat, row B, Republican, C is conservative. That row D, which was Working Families Party, is now going to be the Green Party. And it sounds insignificant, like who cares if the Green Party is ahead of the Working Families Party, whatever. But for a lot of people, they go into the ballot box, they don't really know a whole lot of what's going on, for them, if they see the Green Party first, that could lead to more votes for the Green Party. So in summation, these third parties, fourth parties, whatever you want to call them, um, have a fair amount of influence in New York State in a way they don't have in a lot of other states. Okay, let me ask the panelists another question. There is now a major factor that was established two years ago. Besides all these parties, two years ago, today, New Yorkers and Americans woke up and discovered that Barack Obama won overwhelmingly. And with that, for the first time in a number of years, the Republicans alone could not control the Senate. And they spoke to a state senator uh, from Riverdale and basically said, look, if you give us your votes, we'll give you more power, more money, more influence, something that I heard before. And five Democrats, including one Democratic state senator from the great borough of Staten Island switched and became an independent caucus of five Democrats. They helped the Republicans, who they caucused with, uh, organize the Senate and have a majority. And in doing that, they were promised and they received more power, each and every one of them, more monies, flowing into their district and uh, claimed that they would help the governor achieve his agenda. Now, what is going to happen, in your opinion, to those five individuals who made up the independent caucus because they're no longer needed? The Republicans have a majority of 32 uh, members out of 62, with uh, 63, uh, so the, uh, the uh, Democrats have no way of organizing the Senate, especially since one state senator runs from Brooklyn as a Democrat, but says he will not vote Democratic in Albany, he will vote with the Republicans. So what do you think will happen to this independent lost group of five Democratic senators who switched to the Republican caucus and now have a major decision to make. Shall they, and they said they would come together with the Democrats, but uh, they would not make a difference in terms of the Democrats regaining control of the Senate. The Republicans have a majority now. Uh, with this man from Brooklyn. What's going to happen to this in, but independent caucus of five Democrats? Where will they go? Back to the Democratic Party, where they stand to lose a lot of money and power? Or remain with the Republican Party, even though they will have less power, but more money? Gentlemen? 
had some thoughts on that. Um, I was actually with Senator Jeff Klein. He's the head of the Independent Democratic right. Conference, this five-person breakaway Democratic group. Um, started out as four people, actually, I think four years ago, and they added a person. Someone got indicted and convicted, and they added another person. Um, and he did pledge early on this year that he would work for a Democratic majority in the Senate, that he would reconcile with the mainline Democrats so he would have to kind of eat his words if he, if he decided to stick with the Republicans. However, I, I would add a couple things. One is, it is a very narrow majority, even though the Republicans have a, a majority, an absolute majority in the Senate now. Um, but there is some incentive for Dean Skelos, the Republican leader, to persuade the IDC to stay with them uh, if, if a couple members are sick, um, if you know people can't make it that day, you have a few extra members. Sometimes there's legislation; you can't get every single person in your conference to vote for it. So if you have five more people to work with, uh, you can get things done more efficiently. Um, at the same time, it's you know uh, it would be politically embarrassing for Klein to to back down. But but last night on election night, he was saying he was kind of walking it back a little bit. He was saying look, we accomplished a lot. We're, we were this bipartisan group, we got a lot done, we had on-time budgets. He's really trying to play up now how good it was to have this coalition. Um, and, but then I think the other final thing he has to look at is two years from now, uh, you, you may have Hillary Clinton running for president. Uh, as you were saying earlier, you're gonna have a much larger turnout that tends to help Democrats. So there's a real chance that the Democrats themselves get an absolute majority in 2016. It's a question of where Klein would fit in there. Would he, you know, continue to share power? And if, if the Democrats took control, would they would they marginalize him? Would they take him back? Um, I think you can only jump back and forth so much before you're you're kind of screwed in the end. So, anyone else want to comment? On? Well, yes, John. Am I wrong that Klein, when he made the promise, made it contingent upon them gaining a majority? Yeah. So they don't have a majority, so it would seem like he could say at this point that uh, since we didn't get the majority, I'm going to continue to stay in a position where I'm going to be able to exert some power. Uh, I mean, ultimately, it would seem in the long run that it would make sense for him to move back towards the Democrats, but then again, Democrats have sabotaged themselves often enough in uh, Senate races in the past that there's no assurance that even with a greater turnout, uh, that it will turn around, but I would definitely agree with you that it would be in Skelos's interest to keep some of the independent Democrats in his corner and uh, sharing some power with them. There's only so much that can be done to punish them now on the Democratic side simply because when you are in the minority in the legislature, you really don't have a whole lot of clout. But uh, there is that question of uh, what happens if things suddenly perk up and, uh, you know, they're back in power, at that point you could wield uh, an ax against the people who decided that they were going to stay with the Republicans. So I think it's a delicate balancing act on both sides in terms of how they uh, decide to position themselves. Well, and another quick tangent, you also have two state senators who are indicted. So there's a That's risk true. that, you know, they, they figure it all out, they balance it out, and then while someone's off to jail, Maybe another person's off to jail, and then, well, you'd like to have a few extra members around. Well, one of the great things about the legislature is that that's an example of bipartisanship. You have an upstate Republican under indictment, and you have a Brooklyn Democrat under indictment. And so it could balance out, ultimately. And both won re-election. Yes. He has Handily. did the congressman from Staten Island uh, win re-election. Interesting point. Anyone well, else? Innocent until proven guilty. What is that? Innocent until proven guilty. guilty. The question is whether you want that to be the standard by which you elect people as opposed to <laughs> convict. Well, it, it, it seems like the, the breakaway Democrats are sort of like those relatives who don't want to come to your house for dinner, but they show up and say, well, I'm not going to eat. You know, like they're, they're going to be Democrats. They ran as Democrats. Now, whether or not they fully embrace the leadership of the Democratic conference is a whole other question. You know, as long as they are safely re-elected re from their districts, Jeff Klein in the Bronx, Diane Savino in the Staten, Staten Island, Island Brooklyn, Brooklyn area, 
as long as they keep getting reelected, and as long as there's sort of like a working partnership with Cuomo, there's all sorts of ways that people can sort of cross lines and blur these distinctions. Um, Marty Golden, who's a state senator in Brooklyn, Brooklyn um, he very famously walked through the Senate chambers once to give that to to give them enough of a caucus to advance legislation, but actually didn't vote on what was happening. So he he served a function by helping out. I, I think it was Michael Bloomberg during some kind of taxi legislation. He walked through the chamber so they can have enough warm bodies in the room to perform their function as legislators, and he continued walking right out and didn't actually take a vote. So there's all sorts of things that a Jeff Klein, a Diane Savino could do to help a Dean Skelos without formalizing that relationship. I think the most interesting thing also would be if the Democrats are going to come back, are they going to insist on a condition that has less to do with power than just to try and avoid some of the chaos that you had when briefly the Democrats had the majority in the Senate in 2009 and 2010. Basically at that point you had uh, Malcolm Smith was made the leader of the Democrats. I had been told by a veteran Democratic stalwart back in the summer before they gained the majority in the election that he simply wasn't up to the job that they were going to have to make a change. Apparently a lot of other people believed that because you had this power grab before he could be elected. The power grab was made by some of the people who would have been considered then among the grubbiest people in the Senate, and they proved it by getting themselves indicted and convicted. We're talking about people like Carl Kruger, Hiram Montserrat, and Pedro Espada. And there's a reason that those names might not be familiar to you if you only started following politics in the last couple of years. They've all been removed and criminally convicted since then. And ultimately, there was a level of stupidity and greediness that undid them. I mean, even that coalition did not last that uh, by June of 2009, you had Espada and Montserrat jumping over to the Republicans because they hadn't gotten as much power as they thought they were entitled to. And so you had completely gridlock in the legislature in the one month in which they do most of their business. And it was something, it's understandable that Cuomo likes dealing with Republicans beyond the political wiles that uh, he can use there, simply because the Democrats made such a royal mess when they had the majority. And if I were a member of the IDC, I would be looking to make sure that in terms, of, Democratic in terms of leadership, that you are not doing it based on ethnic reasons, you're not doing it based on political clout or seniority, that you're doing it based on people having reputations for actually being competent and actually being honest. It was as if they threw those standards out the window when they split up leadership posts five years ago. Okay, just one comment on the corruption issue, and then we'll go to the national arena. Uh, you mentioned corruption. A few months ago, I received a call from one of your colleagues, Tom Kaplan of the New York Times. And he said to me, Seymour, do you still have that picture uh, on the wall of your office of your 61 colleagues? At that time, the Senate was composed of 62 members, and as of two years ago, it was changed to 63 members. And I said, of course I do, Tom. He said, I'm doing a story, and I want my facts to be correct. Can you walk over to that picture and tell me what they're doing today? So I walked over to the picture and I said, oh, this one is an attorney. Uh, these two are lobbyists, and uh, this one is a banker. And then I said, this one is in jail. This one was in jail. This one is indicted and faces trial for felony, which usually sends you to jail. And these two were indicted on a misdemeanor that doesn't necessarily send you to jail. Do you know how many people in my class of what, nine, 10 years ago, Mark was a staff member at the, that time in the New York State Senate, how many people do you think were indicted, found guilty? And any ideas? Of 62 people, would you believe that 13 of those 62 were either going to prison, 
served in prison and are out of prison or are having trials that could send them to prison. I mean, that is the highest percentage of any state legislature in the country. Now, Illinois has a higher percentage of governors who are in jail. I'm not sure whether the one is out, it would be two, two or three. But none of the other 49 states has that number of state senators sitting into jail, have come out of jail, or are going to jail. Uh, now, uh, we'll get back to this at the very end. In terms of the national picture, uh, there was a major change in the political dynamics. Uh, the Democrats, uh, we felt, as a Democratic, former Democratic state senator, that we would be able to hold on to the majority. And others felt that the Republicans would win a majority of the 100 Repub uh, of the 100 U.S. Senators. And as you know, since most of you are scholars in government, that each state has two U.S. Senators, whereas the House of Representatives is based upon population. Now, what happened last night was, if not an earthquake, it was a trembling, because the number of senators who were Democrats uh, are now almost the number of Republicans and more in the majority are now Republicans who will be going to the majority. There are three races that are still undecided. In Alaska, Louisiana, which is having a runoff, believe it or not, in December, and uh, Virginia. Of those three races, two will most probably go to the Republicans. One will probably go to a Democrat. So if you add up the differences, there are 52 Republicans already elected in the new Senate. There will be almost certainly 54 Republicans to 46 Democrats and the impact that they could have on President Obama's last two years would be very great. In terms of the House of Representatives, the Democrats in the House of Representatives lost to the Republicans four years ago in a midterm election. And, uh, and it now appears that the Democrats have lost more seats to the Republicans. Now, because the House of Representatives is based upon population, the lines are drawn by the House leadership. So whoever is in control makes it easier for his colleagues to gain election afterwards. Just as in New York State, the Democrats stayed even in the assembly with it, which they control because they control the redistricting. The Republicans in the Senate controlled the redistricting and it was very effective because they knew where to put in what district which lines. So the Republican Party won a majority this year in New York. In Washington, there are many factors that can impact on the president's decision. With a Senate that will have probably 54 and possibly 55 Republicans out of 100 people. And that is, if he vetoes legislation, will the Republicans be able to gather an independent group of Democrats, as in New York State, to join them in getting the two-thirds vote to override the president. 
The only problem with that is most of the centrist conservative Democrats lost to Republicans in this midterm election. So there's no question that the, with Mitch McConnell as the Republican majority leader, Harry Reid, remember from Nevada, who was the majority leader, becomes the uh, minority leader, you will have a, situ a situation that is unmapped and no one knows what will happen. I mean, we, the America, we in America have spent over $1 billion in the last month trying to defeat ISIS, who, as you remember, beheaded several people, uh, Westerners very few, hundreds of uh, their own fellow Muslims who are of a different Muslim persuasion. Over $1 billion and no money was allocated for that. So we have a lot of financial problems in this nation, a lot of econo internal economic issues, and a series of foreign policy issues which has the United States not with boots on the ground, but boots in the air, uh, dropping bombs in Syria, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and major, major problems. So um, I'm going to leave it there and ask my colleagues if there are any comments that they have on the national picture. Um, yeah, I, I think you know. I was very. It was very dramatic. Um, Republican sweep last night, undoubtedly. Um, but I, th I think there's this tendency to take what happened last night and to extrapolate into the future to say, well, this means X, Y, and Z for the 2016 presidential election. This means Hillary Clinton can be president. This means she can't. This means the Republican Party is stronger. Um, what you had here is kind of a bit of a, a snapshot in time and also something that had a lot of historical precedent. I mean, the sixth year of of a second term president is almost always, of the, of the second term president who's in office, usually the opposition party gains seats. President Obama, for a variety of reasons, is increasingly unpopular, and especially in a lot of these states where these elections were. It was a, going, into, going into this cycle, this midterm cycle, it was a very favorable map for, for Republicans. A lot of the state senators who were up for election were in very Republican states trending right. So you had and a lot US of U.S. senators. I mean, U.S. Yeah, some of the U.S. Senate. You had Democrats in Arkansas, uh, you know, Louisiana, um, you know, Alaska to some extent. You, you Democrats in places that really weren't supporting Obama. That were kind of vestiges of this older time when you had conservative Democrats. When you had um, kind of more. Um, ideological diversity in both parties. You don't really have that as much anymore. Like uh, you know, uh, doc, Dr. Lockman said, you, you don't have the, the, the conservative Democrats aren't really in existence anymore. Just as the liberal Republicans are also dead. So you know what you saw was very dramatic last night, and it definitely gives um, you know a boost to the Republicans to an extent going to 2016, and certainly, you know, Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton crisscrossed the country, stumping for a lot of these Democrats who did not win. Um, at the same time, I think 2016 is going to be its own animal, and midterm elections, as we're seeing increasingly so, benefit Republicans dramatically. And the reason is their electorate is kind of tailored to the midterm, while de the Democratic electorate is very much now tailored to the presidential year. So the Democrat Democratic electorate, the Obama kind of coalition, was younger voters, minorities, women, um, you know, a, a very, you know, th this kind of, this, this electorate of people who were inspired to vote but aren't necessarily, especially younger people, aren't necessarily dedicated voters, while the Republican electorate now is older, it's whiter, it's more affluent, those people tend to vote more, especially in these lower turnout midterm elections. So the Republicans have 
these inherent structural advantages going into midterms now. So you saw a sweep four years ago in 2010. We saw it again in 14. I think in 16, the Republicans could win the presidency and they could kind of build on this. At the same time, I think reading too much into this could be, I don't want to say dangerous, but maybe I would, I would caution to treat the 2016 cycle as kind of its own animal, but certainly, you know, take lessons from this and be, be aware of this, but look at 2016 through its own lens. Okay, one more point I want to make before we'll close this with the closing statement. Um, and that point is that uh, last night, I think about one, two in the morning, that's why I'm a little groggy today, uh, CNN released a poll that had taken an exit poll. Usually exit polls involve, who did you vote for? So they have an idea when the polling booths close, who's gonna win? Uh, they're usually correct, but sometimes they're incorrect. But this time they ask another question. Of all voters, who do you think is best qualified and who would you support for President of the United States. Uh, and I'm gonna go from number three to number two to number one. We'll reverse it. Uh, number three, the governor of New Jersey, Chris Christie, who turns almost as many people off with his bombastic behavior as he draws them in. He's one of us. He speaks his mind and should be allowed to speak his mind. Number one, and we'll leave number two for last, is Hillary Clinton, who unquestionably has a lock on the nomination. And if she should decide not to run, there would not be an alternative candidate coming to the fore. Andrew Cuomo lost face with what happened with the Working Families Party and is only being able to get 54% of the vote. Martin O'Malley, who has already announced he would run, the current governor of Maryland, lost face because his lieutenant governor uh, was defeated by a Republican. And it's very rare, oh, this is the third time in 50 years that a Republican has won control of Maryland. And the question is, what's gonna happen? Now I left out the person who's number two. And I'd like to ask you a question. Do you think it's possible for this individual, and he's a Republican, to win the nomination and run for president? And how do you think he would do? His son was elected at the age of 36 yesterday to ag for Agricultural Commissioner of Texas. His name is Jeb Bush. The son of a president, we're speaking of dynasties, the brother of a president. Now both Jeb Bush and Chris Christie are considered centrist in their party in comparison to Rand Paul uh, Senator Paul of Kentucky or Senator uh, Cruz of Texas, they are moderates. But do you think a moderate like either Christie with his bombastic behavior or a moderate like Bush who would be, if nominated and elected, the third Bush in the last uh, 20 years to become president? Or is the Republican Party, in your opinion, closed to moderates like that now? Gentlemen of the press, what do you think? Gentlemen. <laughs> um, I, I think, I don't think it's closed. Um, you know, you saw the 2012 Republican primary, Mitt Romney won. And there was a lot of division there. There was a very, you know, contentious and very crowded primary. You had a lot of, um, you know, more conservative, uh, more ideologues sort of fighting it out. And then Mitt kind of pushed through. 
Um, and I think that scenario could definitely play itself out again. You know, you have uh, Senator Cruz, Senator Paul, uh, Marco Rubio, uh, Scott Walker, a bunch of other bunch of other Republicans too dreaming of running. So I don't think it's closed off. I think if, if Jeb Bush were to run, he'd have his own issues, more so with the Bush legacy, which um, is still not that pop as unpopular as Obama is, there aren't really warm feelings from the Bush years either. I think he's gonna have to run up against that. At the same time, I, I'm me personally I'm always a big doubter of Chris Christie's presidential potential, less so because of the Bridgegate controversy, which I think is an issue, more so because I think the state of New Jersey, you know, fiscally, financially, is not doing very well. You know, it, it's, it's clearly in a state, in, a, in not a good place. I think if you're running for president, it's very hard to make your case to the nation when your own state is struggling so much. So, you know, if Chris Christie of New Jersey was booming, if Chris Christie didn't have Bridgegate, I'd say he's definitely a candidate. And I think Jeb Bush can be a candidate. I also think it's very early, but in sort of a very de divisive primary similar to 2012, you can definitely, I, I, I can still see room for a moderate to uh, push through, but you, know, you never know. We have time for um, one more response. Yes. I would argue that Christie is not a viable presidential contender, both for the reasons that Ross cited in terms of uh, his record as governor and because of his personality. Uh, in terms of Bush, I think that he is a viable contender, notwithstanding the baggage that he brings because of his younger brother, uh, the younger brother who's not supposed to be uh, the smartest of that generation of Bushes. I think that it would be a mistake on the part of the Democrats, even if that's the direction in which they're leaning, to make it into a cakewalk for Hillary to simply get the nomination. And the reason I say that is because Hillary, the one time that she was really tested in a tough battle uh, politically was against Obama, and he rolled over her when she had all the advantages going her way. And I think that the jury is still out as to whether she is really capable of running the type of strong, tough, sustained race that she would need to win in 2016 in a general election. And so that I think at the very least it would be a service to the Democrats if somebody gave her a strong primary fight. I would, I would definitely agree with that. I think the Hillary as the inevitable Democratic nominee um, sort of media storyline is, is a dangerous one because the dynamics of a presidential race, even at this point, are still very unknown. And I would agree, too. She, she, she is, a, I think, more of a flawed candidate than certainly the media and, and certain pundits think. And there could be an issue if she is, is the nominee or... You know, or she, she's in a primary fight. I mean, could she lose again in a primary? Obviously, right now, it doesn't look like it because we don't see anyone running. We don't see anyone lurking. But we're still a long ways away. And I think her problem for Hillary is there's not really an overarching narrative to why she should run again. There's no real case being made at this point as to why we need Hillary Clinton in 2016, other than, you know, she's a woman. But from what we've seen, women won't necessarily just vote for women because they're women. They want to vote for candidates they like and agree with. And, you know, as you saw with Obama and other presidential candidates, the change narrative is much more successful than, hey, I've been here before. Look what, you know, look what Bill did. Um, you know, I was Secretary of State. Um, and now elect me, you know, and, and elect me because I am the anointed one. And that, that narrative doesn't work. Then again, she has so much money and all these operatives are jumping on board now. Maybe she'll be able to steamroll anyone anyway. But I think it's also dangerous to assume she's the automatic uh, crowned next president, next Democratic nominee. Okay, we're going to close the program in a few minutes. I want uh, the uh, people in the press to realize that there were six, there are six uh, there are classes that start at 6 p.m., which is why about a dozen students had to leave. Others have classes starting at 6.30 or 7 o'clock, and I don't want them to leave and leave, leave us talking with each other, which we could always do over lunch or coffee. But I just want to say, as someone who has been in two worlds, alternative worlds, 
I mean, I ran for the state senate when I was university dean and professor at the City University of New York. I wanted to teach about the theory of government, and I found the reality of government, which was as different as night and day. But what turns me off, or has turned me off since I came back from the legislature and have re-entered academic life, is the fact that most of my students over the last seven years that I have been here at Wagner since I left the New York State Senate are so turned off about politics and government that they refuse to roll up their sleeves and get to work to bring about change, even incremental reform. You're never going to get instant reform for everything. But ladies and gentlemen, we need people such as you to become involved politically so that our democracy in the nation and the states not only is a theory, but is a reality. And you have to ask yourselves, will you do it? And when will you start? I want to thank everyone here tonight, and especially Ross Parkin, John Lenz, Ozzy Pabara, Richard Steyer, and um, the interim director of the Cary Institute, Mark Rivlin, our dear provost, and, uh, and others. And we have a board of trustee member here, Oleta Diamond. Bob Diamond, thank you very, very much for being here tonight. Have a good evening. <laughs>